We're so happy to have Dr. Pascal Michael with us, and Joel's going to be reading his bio in just a moment. But first, just a little bit about FIVE. Probably most of you already know about FIVE since you're here, but in case this is your first time to one of our webinars, just explaining a little bit about it. So FIVE stands for 5-MEO DMT Information and Vital Education. And at FIVE, we aim to help shepherd 5-MEO DMT into the world in a safe and effective manner, starting with a centralized hub for resources and education on 5-MEO DMT for the community. Our website includes over 30 pages of free information on 5-MEO DMT, including integration specialists, monthly webinars like this one, scientific research, and more. In addition, we offer free, uh, free bi-weekly integration circles, 5-MEO DMT trainings, and are engaged in clinical research as well as working towards FDA approval in the US. So for anybody who wants to go to that website, it's five-meo.education. All right, and so I can read the bio here, yeah. So thank you so much, Pascal, for being here with us. And so for those who don't know Pascal Michael, Pascal completed his PhD in psychology at the University of Greenwich on a comparative analysis on the uh, neurophenomenology of both DMT experiences and near-death experiences. He is currently a lecturer there, teaching and researching psychedelics, NDEs, entity encounters, related exceptional experiences, and the intersections therein. And so today he's going to be here talking about his research between 5-MeO-DMT and near-death experiences. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, so I'll share my screen and you can tell me if you can see it all there. Can you see that? Perfect. Yep, yep. Yep. Yeah. And if I were to just present like that, um, and if I'm skipping slides, can you see me going through those slides like that? Yeah, they look great. Thank you. Okay. Fabulous. Cool. So, yeah, I'll get stuck in then. Uh, brilliant. So, actually, I'll just minimize that so I can see everything. Excellent. So, yeah, thank you so, so, so much, guys. Um, Thank you so much for for the invite. Really looking for been looking forward to this for for a while. So, um, yeah, as you described in uh, in in the kind bio there, um, yeah. So this this whole this presentation came out of a paper that was recently published just uh, almost a couple of months ago, um, and that that itself was predicated on one of my chapters of my of my doctorate thesis, doctoral thesis, um, and as you say, yeah, it was generally looking at. Uh, and then DNT 5 meo um, also also Changa actually overall looking at them and how they phenomenologically qualitatively compare with the near death experience of the state of, uh, one's experience near death which we'll get onto the definitions and everything of that um, so yeah so that this is this this is the paper it's specifically related to 5 meo and it's called this is your brain on death a comparative analysis of a near death experience and subsequent 5-methoxy DMT experience. Um, so yeah, that's the name of the paper. And um, some random picture there of the mountains that just came with the PowerPoint slide, but but relevant enough, talking about peak <laughs> mystical type experiences here. Uh, so so yeah, so many of your the guys here potentially as attendees, maybe they've come to previous webinars and stuff of yours and familiar with your work and 5-MEO generally. So um, I won't go too much in, in detail with it, but um, so yeah, it's a very, very, very potent classical serotonergic psychedelic substance as uh, acts on the serotonin system. Um, and yeah, it's considered like a classical psychedelic as opposed to other, other ones like Ketamine is kind of like a dissociative anesthetic or salvia works on a very different receptor system, but still has these um, very much profound psychedelic effects, but through different mechanisms and stuff. But that's, so this is 5-MEO. Uh, on the picture on the left, you can see um, a photograph of, of the Yopo snuff, um, which contains 5-MEO, as well as um, the photonine and uh and 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 dot actually and then you've got the sonoran desert toad here so you can see these massive glandular kind of uh, growths on the side there and um, which is what uh is 
productive of of 5 MeO, and it, it also secretes the photin as well, another similar related anal analogous compound. Um, so yeah, so just pharmacologically, 5 MeO acts on many receptor subtypes of the serotonin system, but actually has the greatest affinity for 5-HD1A, which is quite fascinating because by definition, the classical psychedelics seem to exert their kind of classical psychedelic effects via the 5-HD2A, um, but this um, has special affinity for the 1A as well, um, which is intriguing given, as we'll discuss you know, very soon, that it is um, really, really reliably productive of the mystical type experience uh, by Vimeo and it's been it's endogenous so it's i.e it's within it's been found within human the human body um but with the kind of better techniques it's been found kind of more reliably within the cerebrospinal fluid and um, but there have been some like previous studies finding it in like blood and urine and stuff as well um its physiological role is still kind of up for grabs it's not fully fully understood and unknown but um through lab studies and things it has been identified as having pro-inflammatory -infla uh, sorry the suppression of pro-inflammatory and then also uh, an elevation of anti-inflammatory um immunological like mediating chemicals like cytokines so it is it's essentially anti-inflammatory so that could be one of its roles uh, physiologically on a on a purely like physiological level and obviously given its profound psychoactivity you know it's open to speculation uh, as to whether or not it has any kind of implication in other in in in, in the sphere of consciousness of of, of of um actually contributing to psychoactivity in some way and um, if not normative consciousness then potentially alter states of consciousness spontaneous ones uh exceptional human experiences such as potentially the near-death experience which is partly <laughs> motivating for these these kinds of studies and like this chat that i'll be that this whole thing is based on the comparison between five and, and the near-death ex experience um so yeah what about the experience in and of itself at least in terms of what like some literature says about five meo um so ultimately it all really surrounds the mystical experience um so this experience enigmatic can be characterized in many different ways but um there's a kind of you can refer to a kind of classical or core like mystical type experience which might include features of dimensions like uh unitive experiences like oneness or transcendence of space and time the um the sense of dissolution of, of one's ego ineffability paradoxicality um these these kinds of dimensions um so yeah so some studies quantitatively you know and psychometrically kind of finding this that so-called complete mystical experience was was found with like over three quarters of certain sample and complete here really it's a problematic term and kind of potentially contentious to to, to make these distinctions between incomplete and complete mystical experience but it's just a kind of uh, statistical way of referring to this in that um it means over uh 60 percent i believe of of um the kind of mystical experience scale would have been endorsed by 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 75 percent of these participants so essentially meaning you know especially high in terms of it being uh rated on this particular scale um and again there's you know data it being a psychedelic that there when in certain settings and controlled settings um duration of certain setting it uh there's a, a, a an optimization perhaps you could say or, or an elevation of um the state itself the mystical experience as well as the long-term um you know desirable like transformations thereof so the sense of meaningfulness spiritual effects um, and and one's 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 well-being um, and again, you know, similar findings showing, showing very, very similar things. And uh, there was a recent completion of a, of a phase one clinical trial with 5-MeO um, <clears throat> and with, you know, various doses finding that, you know, with increasing dose, there is this, this, uh, this, this demonstration of this um, very unmistakable peak mystical experience. So how about the NDU? Um, so the, again, this is just looking at the literature and kind of just 
as a possibility of com comparing the two um before going into the actual study or studies like it which look at deeply at the qualitative nature of, of each of them to make some kind of um inferences uh, about the about the two of them but just in terms of what what we know from like literature so the nde essentially at least a classical what you could refer to as a classical near-death experience is a um as a constellation of sub experiences and you know, features of experience which happen within a life-threatening context hence near-death experience um but then interestingly you know there is there are studies um arguing with this idea that's that's actually at least when using quantitative scales um which are very important and instructive but also have their limitations um there's no difference between uh, actual quote unquote like near death experience when you know let's say you're having cardiac arrest or you know traumatic injuries or whatever um and what are referred to as near death like experiences um so this could be anything from uh hypnosis to syncope like um passing out certain neuropathologies like temporal lobe epilepsy or certain meditative styles and things like that but also drug induced experiences i.e you know as an example, five MEO or other psychedelics. Um, so, so all all of these different inducers of, of can potentially generate experiences which look exactly like near death experiences, at least when looking at uh, the a scale, a quantitative measure such as the near death experience scale, um, which in the eighties was developed to kind of standardise what near death experience is um but basically i did a whole <laughs> the, whole, the whole kind of beating heart of my actual doctorate thesis was looking at um how true that claim kind of actually is because like i said so these scales are quite limited um and so this core part of my thesis was actually looking at qualitatively what's the difference between um a drug induced near-death experience and an actual near-death experience um and i did that between two different groups near-death experiences and people had near had, had a nn dmt experiences um so whole whole different classes of people um and then this this what essentially i'm talking to you about today is another part of that but it's looking at a single individual actually who had a near-death experience and a 5meo uh experience but also looking at it very much the, the detail level of of uh, the qualitative experience which would um nuance the the picture so these are some examples of some of the, of the features of the near-death experience um these are seems to be the best data as to what the most common features actually are from this study in 2014 so deep positive mood like bliss bodily dissociation like sense of disembodiment bright light or or like bright lights um you know the kind of what everyone understands and to think of maybe the near-death experience like seeing light at the end of a tunnel but it's that light which seems to be um most commonly experienced just encountering deceased loved ones relatives family members encounters with uh, other other beings but of a kind of godlike or divine nature sometimes referred to in the near-death literature as like beings of light uh, or or time distortion and transcendence so these are the commonest features um and just kind of off the bat before going into any detailed qualitative comparison we, you know we, we can see um that it's um quite quite redolent you know re reminiscent of of what we can understand with 5meo um, itself because we have you know the sense of bliss like not feeling your body anymore um the, the light is something that's very characteristically associated with the 5 million experience um and uh and the transcendence of time and space and we'll see in this particular case study that was quite prevalent for the for, for, for the person in in both both the 5 million and, and, and the nde things like encountering other beings that's kind of as will be an important conclusion of the whole thing like that's actually not that commonly experienced with with 5-MEO um, certainly can happen but it certainly isn't one of the most common and again you know these are just the most common but this is just to show you this is this is the most recent kind of 
imp improvements of of the original scale that measures near death experience. So this is many different features which um, you could potentially find in the kind of broader syndrome of the NDE. Um, so you just like read them at kind of your own uh, leisure. I've just highlighted. You should hopefully be able to see a bit in yellow, like a handful of them, because those are the ones which were added to the original scale, which was from the eighties um so things like uh just experiencing unusual sensations um interestingly the feeling of dying wasn't on the original scale but but certainly is an important and repeatedly reported um, element of the nde um a decision to come back um entering a kind of a, a gateway through something like a tunnel for instance um and ineffability again important for the mystical type state also the sense of being like a void um which 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 came from a thematic analysis of a of distressing their death experiences actually um but um but the void is a very complex phenomenon and um uh isn't necessarily a uh experienced in a kind of distressing kind of way um and again paradoxically it can be considered as both emptiness and 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 fullness, and hopefully we'll we'll, we'll touch on that actually in, in a bit. So, what's the point of doing this study, basically, which is looking at differences, similarities, etc., between the five MEO state and the near death state? So, um, so there has been quite a few studies looking at looking at near death experiences and psychedelics more broadly. In different kind of ways um one with n and dmt others with uh, ketamine or um, a particular one marshall not 2019 one looking at is using a semantic analysis so looking at very very many different psych psychoactive substance reports and then also a big corpus of near-death experiences and uh finding that yeah ketamine salvia other serotonergic psychedelics they seem to be most similar near death experiences and then as i mentioned before um important part of my thesis was looking at the qualitative nature of an and uh, and the nde but um but there hasn't been a single study looking at 5meo and uh, near death experiences so naturally just a simple fact for that it's important to do such a study um there was but there have been at least well at most it seems two studies um looking at a psychedelic experience and a near-death experience within particular people so people would have both experiences um <clears throat> so this study that i'm talking about is is unique in, in doing that but there have been a couple of other studies um one with lsd so a classical psychedelic like five in year, and another with um with with ketamine so a non-classical psychedelic but they were both done very very crudely you no know, measures involved and um, no qualitative analysis or anything just reports um essentially just uh just kind of cruder descriptions um so again uh important reason to do such a study is as is, is, is this adding to the body of knowledge so what specifically about this study um kind of is is unique um what the methods that that uh that i conducted not ultimately is a very very simple study um i met somebody who, um, from reading the paper, it's very likely that people will be able to identify him because um, uh, he uh, wrote a book on on his near-death experience. Um, but I'll just refer to him as Nikolai or just the because that was the pseudonym that they gave themselves um, or I'll just refer to him as the, the participant. So I met this individual, knew about their near-death experience, uh, but they also informed me that they had a 5-MEO DNT experience. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to uh, conduct a study. Um, so I used the book as the narrative of the near-death experience, but then I also interviewed him for uh, a good hour and a half regarding not his NDE, because I had that data, but all about his 5-MEO DNT experience he had. And, um, and then naturally asking him, leveraging you know the unique position that he's in having both of these experiences himself like asking him to compare the two states themselves and reflect on it um as to what the similarities and differences are and effects effects on him that they both had and uh conducted a thematic analysis on both of those both the book and the interview and then simply compared them it's quite quite uh quite simple and this ultimately is is the 
the results of the study in a nutshell. Um, so it says everything here ultimately in one single image. Um, nice neat Venn diagram. So you can see that there are many different features that were reported in both of the states, but on the left, well, ultimately both on the left and the middle, so all the features which are listed, those are all um, the experiences which were found within the near-death experience. But it's only in that middle, the overlapping part, um, which which were identified in the in the five MEO state. Um, so that those those that constellation of features from the five MEO state overlapped with the NDE. Um, so so it was this particular sub constellation of features from all of the near-death features that the 5-MEO very evidently and uh, you know, potently modeled or simulated or reproduced, right? But these ones on the far left, they didn't. The 5-MEO wasn't able to like re reproduce them. So we've got the core features of the mystical state, dissolution of ego, transcendence of time, space, oneness, etc. cetera, that um, was, what really was it foundational kind of constituents of the five MEO, um, but also those were featured in the near death as well. There were all of these other features, however, in the near death state that weren't in the in the in the five MEO state. So meeting of different kinds of entities, entering other kind of worlds, uh, having this sort of review of one's life, and um, encountering of deceased uh, loved ones, um, coming to a point of kind of no return. These things didn't come up in the five million. Um, so, yeah. On on the whole, you could describe it as these kind of more dualistic or interactive or relational components. Um, that was very endemic to the NDE, and didn't actually see that with the five million. Um, so that's that's that in in a nutshell. But the but the whole point of these kind of studies and what I'm passionate about doing thesis on on such things is not just looking at this gross kind of level the superficial level just the features but actually looking at the, the words that are used the the, the the richness of the experience in and of itself so let's actually look at some of those so i'll kind of be looking at the nde and then the 5meo left and right as a kind of comparison um first looking at the similarities between the two states and then moving on to the differences so one of the first similarities is the sense of dissolution of ego. So what um, the participants said about their near-death experience <clears throat> is the following. So they said, I had no real center of consciousness. I didn't know who or what I was, or even if I was, I was simply there. I was in a position similar to that of someone with partial but beneficial amnesia, a person who's forgotten some key aspects about himself, but who benefits from having having forgotten it i come from nowhere um so it's interesting that he refers to this idea of um uh partial but beneficial am amnesia it's, it's interesting kind of leads into some bit of the conclusion that, that i'll get to eventually and um, that's it's the language that's being used is um someone essentially that didn't have the, the vocabulary to to describe the state that they were going through because essentially this is a classical case of ego ego death or ego dissolution um and then in the five meo um saying my ego mind was gone only that inner observer the neutral observer i.e was there the voice in your head isn't who we are um awareness within is the part of us which expands um when liberated from the shackles um of of of, of the body at death so important that in the context of the five MEO when describing that same ego ego death state, you know, they are already couching it in the sense of that is what um what happens at the point of death as well. <clears throat> so the transcendence of time and space. So this isn't necessarily just a com comparison of two of them, because he was in a single tract describing the, the similarities and differences. So saying that the five MEO compared to the end, it was more profoundly and richly imbued the witnessing of the interleaving of time and space. It was like you could see all the various elements of space-time and all the permutations. Um, and he saw it essentially in, in, in the following way, geometric patterns uh, that included what I call counterfactuals, 
and you described that term as meaning possibilities that were there for a choice, but that my uh, higher soul rejected. Um, he could see cause and effect over time space, but all at once. Um, yeah, fascinating, fascinating uh, extract there. And then saying that um, it was like having a microscope in my NGE's core realm. So he's referring to this particular part of his his NDE, which refers to as the core realm, which seems to be kind of the deep most element. It's kind of a void-like experience um, uh, that, hence, the core seems to kind of be the kind of core of, of the kind of cosmos. So he's saying that in the in the five MEO state, he was it was like having a microscope in that part of his near death uh, journey and being able to look at why things appeared the way they did in his previous near death experiences. Um, and seeing the mechanisms of it um so in the five meo what it what it gave him uh, over and above the nde is the ability to witness into leaving and he saw it in the sense of seeing and visualizing these kind of fancy tiles referring to this kind of geometric experience um so yeah so that was a kind of min visual manifestation allu alluding to these kind of mechanisms of the, what it means to have kind of exited time and space so again, the sense of oneness. So in the near-death experience, he says that everything was distinct, but everything was also part of everything else, like intermingled designs on a Persian carpet. Time and space are tightly, intricately meshed. Um, all worlds are part of uh, overarching reality. Um, and again, something I refer to as kind of in theogenesis, like the uh, sense of um, kind of identifying with the divine. Uh, he describes a oneness with God. Uh, my awareness or higher soul experience was identical with with God. Uh, conscious awareness at its root is that God force. And uh, also, very very poignantly, saliently, you know, equ 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 equating that to a sense of love, actually. So, um, so this idea of uh, of not just. <clears throat> becoming one with kind of everything but it's the, in the process of that there's an identification with the divine and five meo is kind of colloquially being referred to as like the god molecule because one can um can identify with this kind of god uh constitution of the universe as well. uh, and again in the five meo it states that um uh so, so the core realm of the near-death experience the oneness um and he says to me, in all of my psycho experiences, the thing that mo most matches up with that sense of oneness is the five MEO. So that was very important, just direct quote that uh, the sense of oneness was was ultimately the same um, between the five MEO and the NDE. But then he does actually kind of qualify that. So while this is looking at the similarities, and that was the one of the most fundamental similarities does qualify that saying that actually the 5-MEO is like looking through a peephole as opposed to being full bore swimming or being immersed in the Pacific Ocean of being completely into that oneness which he experienced within the near-death experience so so there's a kind of a, kind of a important caveat there really so in differences um and there's going to be a few examples of these but in the um what I guess is important to keep in mind with this is that is that while these are features which came up in the near-death experience and not the 5-MEO, um, this was this in this single individual, and while it might not have come up in, in this 5-MEO experience, um, it's they're all certainly um they're all certainly it's possible for one to find them. In other psychedelic experiences, namely like NNDMT or, or ketamine, for instance, um, but uh, but they but they may well not be actually very common at all in five MEO experiences generally, even you know outside of this particular individual. So in the NDE, he refers to um, like multitude, very rock kind of uh, panoply of different different entities. So like grotesque animal faces. Um, what's interesting is that he refers to the this, this idea that the more I began to, began to feel like a me, the more faces uh, kind of occurred and the more they became ugly and threatening. It was interesting because it kind of alludes to this idea that there's this kind of diametric relationship between having a kind of ego, egoic state of mind and, uh, and that kind of oneness and the lack of 
relating to kind of entity. So when there was a recrystallization of a sense of his self, then there was more of this in these interactions with these beings, um, but also interestingly in a kind of distressing way. <clears throat> And then he also describes seeing a beautiful girl um, who kind of telepathically communicates with him and and communicated this very, very, very profound message that uh, he was loved, cherished, and he had nothing to fear, and there's nothing that he can do wrong. So these, so again, this this by definition, very interactive relationship having he's having with these entities and um, by them communicating these messages, for instance. <clears throat> But also kind of more of a mystical encounter with um, more kind of maybe higher order abstract uh, sentiences, perhaps you could say, um, a divine breeze shifting into a higher octave and um, began putting questions to this wind um, uh, and to the importantly the, this divine being that he sensed operating behind or within this uh, what you refer to as like a wind and again this kind of telepathic very psychedelic um, means of mode of response and then also in this core realm in this last quote here he there was a kind of uh, angelic interpreter and in, in the form of like an orb which uh, according to him helped as a kind of intermediary um, between him and this uh, this kind of this divine being that, 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 that constituted or inhabited this core realm, which is a very actually angelic function um, between man uh, and, uh, and and the Godhead, perhaps. So we've had entities, also other worlds, this other defining feature of what it means to have a more dualistic kind of interaction. So in the NDE, he said that there was... Um, Though this is only in the ND, as are all of these differences, because they weren't found in the five MEA. So he said that there was countryside, lush, green earth, but at the same time it wasn't. Um, and this kind of echoes some scholarship, for instance, by like this uh, was my examiner of my uh, PhD thesis, actually Gregory Shushan, who describes indigenous and uh, and other kind of archaic NDEs, which very kind of more often than not describe. And earth, uh, what he refers to as an idealized mirror image of of earth um that comes up in, in near-death experiences which is very much exactly like what um this has been described um as you can sort of kind of see there this kind of archaic vision of a kind of heavenly space um and uh so things like having a review of your life or encountering deceased loved ones that occurred in the nde but not in the five mio um and he didn't really have a classical review of his life, um, the kind of life flashing before your eyes or reanimation of your life that uh, can happen. But there certainly was the sense of evaluation of one's life, um, <clears throat> evaluation of one's deeds and the context of one's whole life, which is which is very crucial to the life review. Um, and uh, also he described uh, what so-called peak in Darien experience, which is a kind of anomalous feature of near-death experience, wherein one sees uh loved ones who have died yet they at the time had didn't know that that person had died um <clears throat> so that occurred in his, his, his NDU. um um so yeah so he says he kind of comments on that here and also says just directly that these things like encountering these loved ones and having a view of your life seem to be shallow in psychedelic experiences um so that is essentially very much lining up with this whole analysis in that in it, that they didn't happen in this five experience. And again, it really mirrors what my similar conclusions were in my other uh, chapter about N and DMT, which is where these kinds of re re reviews of your life or especially encounters with um with other entities <clears throat> are much more common in the ND in the in the DMT um uh, space uh, as opposed to the sorry the the near death experience than the dmt um and the slight nuances between differences between nd and 5meo certainly and nd and, and, and dmt and, and, and the nd and nndmt sorry too many acronyms <clears throat> um but uh the things like encountering the deceased loved ones is much more common in ndes uh much less common in uh in nndmt and and potentially even less common in 5MEO, but the encountering entities at large um, is is quite similar with 
both near-death experiences and NNGMT, but certainly not very common at all with 5-MEO. So, <clears throat> clarify that. And the last difference, touch on the sense of like void, because he also described that quite clearly in his NDE um, as an in, immense void, dark, infinite, uh, but also infinitely comforting. Pitch black, also brimming with light. So <clears throat> it's an important quote because it, it, it represents the kind of paradoxicality that lies within these uh, mystical type states. Um, both simult apparently simultaneously light and, and, and dark. <clears throat> but it's interesting to think how much of that is really a perceptual phenomenon since it is paradoxical and how much of that really is more of a cognitive or, or abstract or indeed like mystical phenomenon. Um, and yeah, and while he didn't describe a void per se in his NDE, uh, sorry, in his 5-MEO, whereas he clearly did in his NDE, um, there were there was a certain implicit feeling in the descriptions of the 5-MEO that were void-like, but he didn't couch that in any way as being a sense of emptiness, but actually one of um, of, of, of kind of maximal fullness. <clears throat> so just to add a little complimentary quantitative analysis, so simply asking him um, how to rate out of 10 what were the similarities between his NDE and 5-MEO, and he said extremely low. He said 2 out of 10. And again, for the question of, how likely he thought it was that his NDE could be related to endogenous 5-MEO or similar compounds. And again, he said extremely low. Um, and that was also reflected in his quantitative uh, sort of self-rating thing here on the near-death experience scale. And you can see all the blue is ratings for the NDE and all the orange is ratings for the 5-MEO. <clears throat> and it's only really in the um in in the sense of going to another world or transcendence of time which he scored quite highly for the 5-MEO as well as the uh and and the NDE which echoes all the qualitative analysis that I've just gone through with you here so it's interesting that despite evidently what we've just gone through is the real um almost identicality of the core mystical experience and, and that part in the NDE um he when self reflecting rating on it actually he he decides to kind of really could argue kind of undermine those similarities um in his perspective on the whole they were, were actually as, as dissimilar to justify these kinds of self-rated um, responses <clears throat> so i'm not going to go into this um because we are already at almost 40 minutes and i definitely want to leave time for discussion and questions and everything like that um but just to say that in the paper i did go into lots of different possible mechanisms as to how the, these kind of this kind of phenomenology came up in his NDE which is separate from the the possibility of 5-MEO in uh um using it but this one here the idea of what's in the paper is referred to as cortical disinhibition and the anarchic brain <clears throat> I guess just to skim over that is quite an important part of the paper in that I was arguing that it's really even if you do find an identical nature of the experiences between a drug experience which is endogenous and the and the near death experience it doesn't it's a simplistic thing to say that well it's just because it was produced um that same compound was produced because i was kind of making a possible argument that um damage to the cortex uh, in certain conditions certain lamina like layers of the cortex the neocortex could potentially mimic um what Psychedel endogenous psychedelics would otherwise do even if they weren't themselves implicated um, because psychedelics act on a certain layer of the of the um of the cortex um and essentially work in the, in the long run downstream uh in the brain to 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 reduce to disintegrate higher order uh brain networks which are themselves inhibitive so when they're disintegrated there's a disinhibition that involves this that can occur leading to kind of um upsurge of um of yeah so-called intrinsic otherwise inhibited neural information um and uh that but that happens with psychedelics but it could be mimicked by by anoxia like of oxygen blood blunt trauma to the breath to the cortex which could lead to a similar downstream mechanism if that if, if, if that makes sense but that's just a skim over that so last couple of slides really um 
as was quite evident in the first one of the first slides showing that diagram um for the five five mu experience simulated and therefore may or like i said before may not necessarily contribute physiologically to the classical dimensions of a mystical experience such as transcendence of time and space but also oneness i some reason kind of emphasized <clears throat> transcendence of time and space in the paper but what was quite clear in his own words is that that sense of oneness was also actually fundamentally the same however they also said that um even that five year mystical experience was a kind of partial window into into that same part of the near-death experience but then he also said coming which makes it more similar between the two that there was a kind of finer resolution in the five year if you remember i said that he said it was kind of like when he was in the 5MEO state, it was kind of like looking with a microscope to see all of the detailed mechanisms of what was going on in his equivalent kind of sense of oneness in the near-death experience, which is very, very interesting. And again, just simply what that Venn diagram displayed is that all these kind of more dualistic or relational elements of the near-death experience weren't at all found in the, in the 5MEO. Um, Sam Harris, actually, soon after the publication of his, his original book, said that it's not only is it in the same ballpark as NNDMT, but his near-death experience was actually the same stitching on the same ball as NNDMT. So he's saying they're just identical, <clears throat> which is kind of fair enough. But when you do an analysis like this, it's just what I just did. It comes a bit more nuanced and you know, kind of clearer that um, it's these more dualistic elements, actually, like the encountering with other beings, the, the emergence in another kind of world. The, um, yeah, um, that stuff is actually more reproducible by NMDMT and the mystical, more non-dual kind of states uh, is really the domain of, of 5-MEA. Um, interesting that he rated the experiences quite low um, himself in terms of their similarity. And while it's really, really important as any researcher to listen exactly to their informants and study participants, for their especially when you're asking about their own subjective experience and you're putting that uh, as a prime, you know, you're, you're your imputing importance to listening to their subjective experience it doesn't it's kind of a bit then hypocritical to then undermine that and um, by saying um like i have potentially argued here in the paper that it might be that their low their rating of the experiences is, is not very similar it might be because one might require <clears throat> a larger psychedelic experiential repertoire so having many different psychedelic experiences can ultimately cause one to be more likely to endorse the idea that endogenous psychedelics could lead to the nde because of one's personal experience of certain psychedelic experiences looking very much like one's own nde or, or ndes generally whereas this individual only had uh essentially one of the and in GMT and like a couple of other five MEO, but were much lower doses. And when asked about them, he couldn't really remember them. And it was only really this one five MEO experience that he said he could really remember properly, or, or the other ones seemed to kind of blur into this one. And again, it's only a single person. So that's the fundamental limitation of the study. And again, like I said, even though we do see that there are lots of these um, overlaps with the mystic core mystical experience, it doesn't necessarily mean that the five MEO. Is released and is, is uh, responsible for that because internal psychopharmacology is exceptionally complex, more complex than, than that. And like I kind of theorized or speculated, and um, there could be just actual neurological reasons which could um, mimic that. You can't explain the near death experience when you can't even explain consciousness. So even if we have an endogenous theory of uh, you know, compounds producing it, um, that, that that only really constitutes the so-called easy problem of consciousness, finding correlations between brain and subjective experience. And we're always left with the hard problem. How does consciousness come about? So, um, and, but importantly, there were these, like I mentioned before, there was this OB, there was this peak in Darien experience. So this idea that he saw his, uh, what was eventually identified as his biological sister who he hadn't met um, and who had actually died, but uh, saw this individual in his in his near death experience, <clears throat> and then also had an OBE when he was in hospital, when he's in very very deep coma, and then reported afterwards correctly that at a time when he was in deep coma, these particular people that he wouldn't have anticipated to visit him were visiting him. So these are kind of anomalous features of the NDE, but 
that also occurs in fibromyalgia. So again, these are essentially other features of his NDE that were, that although they weren't reproduced by his own 5-MEO, they certainly are reported with other side effects and 5-MEO. So for instance, in a survey by my old supervisor, um, showing that 5-MEO out of many, of many different psychedelics was found to most commonly really, uh, re lead to these death-like experiences. But also, 5-MEO um, is associated with having OBEs, um uh, as well as other kind of anomalous phenomena here so 5-MEO and other psychedelics are all still able to kind of reproduce these other anomalous features which were in his, his near-death experience and many other people's near-death experiences um so this is just to say that while you can have a neurochemical quote-unquote theory of the near-death experience um there are certainly all these anomalous phenomena which are otherwise inexplicable in just a reductionist neural uh paradigm and um, so yeah people don't really like the neurochemical hypothesis for NDEs because they think it's reductionist but i'm exceptionally open-minded to this to psychedelics themselves being very unexplained in their fuller form of phenomenology um just because of time i think it'll be nice to actually just kind of end here and um, because there's some of this stuff might come in uh um, come, come up in the, in the kind of q a stuff and um, which is just so the, the, this is implications for consciousness, but there are also very, very important implications for for therapy, um, which yeah, hopefully we can we can get onto that in a bit of a, in a bit of a discussion maybe. Um, but if you want to read more, just as an example about this stuff, and um, this paper has been quite nice, been getting quite a lot of kind of coverage, and this is just one paper, the most recent one, um, by SciPost, which. Uh, they, uh, they just interviewed me about it and read the paper and, and wrote some, some stuff about it there, and um, which I say more to possible kind of therapeutic implications. So, so yeah, I'll uh, end there then. And thank you very, very much. And um, I have some questions. Yeah. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. That thank was you wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, it's a really, really interesting. And I, uh, I hope that we can see some sort of study like this with a much broader um, depth, because just as you said, it was based on those two participants who have had, you know, their their limited experience. And what was really interesting, you know, when we saw all those other, especially on that Venn diagram, you know, I would say all of those, except for two, were very common ones we see here at the center. You know, we probably have two to three retreat uh, groups here per month. So we serve a lot of processes mm -hmm. and get to see a whole lot of different type of experiences. And the only two that were not common out of those were um, the seeing entities and deceased loved ones. But we have had a few cases of that happening. They're just less common. Um, and of course, more common with NNDMT. But uh, yeah, that was really, really interesting to see the uh, the similarities in phenomenology. That was great. And uh, yeah. so everyone knows if you have questions, there's a Q&A area um, down at the bottom of your screen and you can speak questions or you can ask questions right in there. And I know um, there was one question just asking if you can provide a link to the paper or let people know where they can uh, find that paper by chance. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just link that right now. Amazing. Uh, other, other questions might come in. <clears throat> the void was an interesting one. And that's uh that's one that we have that we do see fairly commonly you know some people in their full release experience go kind of to that blinding bright light and some go to that uh that void that perfect emptiness you know that you can look at as like that hollow womb from which creation can emerge but uh that vast perfect emptiness is something we do hear uh quite a bit about i see we've got one from nicole you want to read that out yeah i'm just trying to find where the first all right, I'm just going to read the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is incredibly fascinating. Thank you. It is interesting that the NDE plus 5-MEO experiences are seemingly positive, unity, oneness, etc. Was this also your observation? Um, and I'm going to continue. That participants who compared their 5-MEO experience to an NDE did so positively. I describe a void-like feeling in one of my bigger five experiences, and it is still difficult to reflect on that with mm -hmm. optimism. Secondly, after having completed your thesis, would you recommend this topic? I am considering this exact subject for my PhD thesis. Many thanks. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, first of all, 
more research the merrier you know <laughs> definitely endorse doing doing a kind of thesis on on that um because like i said there's um there's not this is the only paper that's looked at by vimeo and and near-death experiences um so, and yeah i mean it's just so preliminary and i mean i am involved in a survey a much kind of bigger survey looking at multiple psychedelics um and people having experiences of both and um, so hopefully there will be some with more um like if we're th thinking about five meo like uh it would be a bigger sample you know be more interesting in terms of looking at what the similarity of differences really are from you know not just from one individual and like you guys were saying it's very interesting that um from all the people that you see you know that it certainly doesn't really make sense to just pigeonhole something like the five MEO experience and people are going to have extremely different variegated experiences and some of them will look more some of them less like NDEs and um, so uh yeah and so definitely scope for that so um I'm supportive of that and um, the idea about the just kind of yeah how people it feel about them and uh, in, interpret them in terms of the kind of positivity or negativity or just the valence of them um yeah, I mean, in terms of near-death experiences, there's um there's a 1990s paper by Grayson and Bush, um, uh, and then Bush actually wrote a book all about it, a very touching, poignant book called Dancing Past the Dark about her very, very, very challenging near-death experience. Um, and there's another paper uh, just recently in the last few years um, doing more of a systematic thematic analysis of, of you know, so-called distressing near-death experiences, uh, finding like basically 14% of uh, near-death experiences at large do report distressing features or just were distressing overall. Um, and that was kind of interestingly re repeated in terms of the main kind of constellation of features that were found in this first study of the, in the 80s um, or no, 90s. And um, so the idea of it just being looking like an actual near-death experience like a normal one um but being experienced basically negatively so there was a so the phenomenology looked the same but it was actually very distressing and there was another sort of subtype as it were which was kind of more classical boshy and hell-like kind of experience with like demonic kind of entities and things of like torture and things like that that was uh, one another type of near-death experience that some people have reported also the sense of a void um which is similar to what bush as the original author um described in her own nde about it about there being a sense of nothingness and this nihilistic feeling of yeah um of, of the dark side of the void as it were and uh, but it was also actually interestingly associated with a more of a, this relational element of this um a kind of voice which communicated some dark things to her you know about the illusory nature of reality and her sense of self and stuff like that um but uh yeah that's at least in terms of a, 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 certainly a minority of near-death experiences um and with 5meo i'm certainly less uh, specifically um clued up as to all the literature of all the different phenomenology that come from 5meo but actually there's actually very very little like in the like academic literature compared to NDEs so again that could be something that would be a really interesting thing for you yourself if you're interested in, in pursuing looking at the details of the qualitative nature of 5MEO especially for the valence of it uh, but it's a big long question I already feel like I'm answering a bit in a bit too long way but there's always so much to say and there's an institution called the Qualia Institute and they look at 5MEO quite a bit um, and they you know something they say is that the 5MEO is um yeah, it's kind of like this maximally content full. Well, with the neuroscience, you could you could refer to it as a kind of a maximally content full experience. So as opposed to this void like experience, which is what some people report, um, and that kind of mirrors the the, the neuroscience because the, it, there's a maximal state of entropy. So entropy is a measure of consciousness potentially. It's a it's a it's an index of of com of complexity like in the brain or unpredictability of the activity of the brain. And that can, so that correlates with content of consciousness, really. So if you have a 5MEO and it feels like this void, this empty like void, what's happening in the brain theoretically is the actual inverse. It's maximal content. It's kind of maximal consciousness. And it's just so unrelentingly fascinating that that mirrors the kind of the religious or spiritual 
um, text and descriptions, like with the Buddhist like sense of nirvana or dharmakaya state in the the Tibetan Buddhist tradition of the kind of bardos of entering the, what they refer to as like the clear light or the ground of being. So that's like a void like experience, but it's the it's 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 not empty at all it's it's pregnant with everything and full potential and so there's a um that is related to the to the sutra the of um two truths which states fullness is emptiness or form is emptiness which is what i've at least usually heard to the kind of quote is kind of truncated but actually it's form is emptiness emptiness is form um so it's this paradoxical state of the two so i think it's all very it's because i didn't get onto the, the therapeutic kind of elements of the of the last slides but um there's another paper recently by peter siostad hughes who is uh his last paper also in the same journal frontiers in psychology um is basically arguing for metaphysics so an understanding of metaphysics in psychedelic integration because these people are having mystical i.e metaphysical experiences and uh all that they're getting is psychological kind of support or some modalities of therapy which are totally not metaphysically informed um so even these kind of discussions about what the philosophy philosophy religion have to say which is a lot about these mystical states um that is that is going to be very. It's going to potentially it could potentially make the di all the difference in kind of between night and day when integrating these very 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 far out experiences and you know in a very helpful guiding kind of kind of manner. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Where is it? Abby Lutz says, have you read Sam Pernia's work or uh, Robert Monroe, ESP, Journeys Out of the Body? Um, yeah, I haven't read that particular book, um, but I'm kind of familiar with Monroe and have and have read some of Sam Pernia's books on and papers on the death experiences. Yeah. Do I need, is Eric asking for a comment <laughs> on that? <or> <laughs> Just an inquiry, I suppose. Yeah. And so... Uh, our dear, uh, our dear friend over here, Sandra, says, uh, you mentioned the contrast of the oneness of 5-MeO-DMT versus duality of ND and NN-DMT. Do you feel this is connected to a lack of a sense of individuated self for 5-MeO versus NDEs? Or what is your view or um, of this difference of reported experience? Thank you, and great talk. Um, I, yeah, I think I get the strands of that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, so there's the asking of kind of the relationship between oneness and and an individuated sense of self, and yeah, hundred percent. So this, they're inextricably linked, um, phenomenologically, somehow neurologically, and although those details aren't fully kind of hashed out, but yeah, the, the so there's kind of this idea that the the um, ego dissolution or you know this loss of sense of self is the is one side of of, of a coin, the other side being. Um, uh, unit of the unit of experience so they kind of come ha hand in hand and um yeah because it seems like you can't necessarily have one without the other and um, like if you're having a fully immersed unit of experience typically there isn't also the sense of self and if you have a total sense of loss of your of yourself then there also seems to be this accommodating uh, accompanying sense of, of of singularity and oneness with everything so yeah so the, the, certainly the phenomenology there I mean, there's certainly something to be said about the paradox of if it's ever possible to have, um, a f like to be fully immersed in oneness. Does that, I mean, that just, you know, that's just something that will just blow your brain for like the rest of your life, really. How is that? Because it would, it could imply that there's still necessarily an observer um, who's observing the oneness. Um, and so there's some purpose perseveration of like a kind of dualistic thing even with this non-dual non state um but yeah i mean other than that there's a uh, yeah and the neuroscience the level of the neuroscience as i mentioned there's um i mean there's lots of neuro, you know there's so much psychedelic neuroimaging that's happening now since the very just the very first one was only like 10 years ago but there's so much now looking at all the more sophisticated nuances of 
what's going on in the brain in the psychedelic state and especially like the interest being like the mystical experience because that being very important for like the therapeutic outcome um and there's, so there's you know a few things i could say about that like the the disintegration of certain networks in the brain like the default mode network which is kind of the thing that we're all have inhabiting now which is that which is responsible for really a, it's kind of like the scent the seat of the self re reflecting on the past and that prospection about the future and stuff mind wandering where we get our narrativized sense of self when that network disintegrates that's both correlated with well certainly sense of self but also like the sense of unity um but also as that's happening there's another network which is called the task positive network which is basically if we're not mind wandering and we're suddenly focused on some internal even or external goal derived goal driven kind of activity um that is the network which is sort of turned on so they're kind of when one is turned on, the other's turned off, and vice versa. So they're kind of antagonistic normally. But when the when the default mode network is disintegrated, like in these psychedelic like five immune experiences, um, and that activity is kind of down, then there's also a corresponding uh, kind of equ equilibration um with the task positive network. So basically, all I'm saying is that when the, the 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 normally the default mode network and the task positive network are kind of at odds, but when the default mode is kind of dysregulated, then the two networks kind of become more on a single level. They kind of they're not differentiated anymore, so they kind of blur into one. And so this idea that this network, which kind of codes for your interiority and interior experience for instance and then this this network which is very much engaged in the in the kind of outside world which mediates that which isn't you suddenly kind of become the same so as far as your brain is concerned the inside and outside world are the same thing so that's again at least on a neuroscience level how the sense of ego dissolution is kind of the other side of the coin of the unitive experience so I hope that that's uh, yeah illuminative in some way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to add actually while we were, uh, you mentioned uh, neuroimaging, while everyone's here, um, you know, very soon we will be putting out an announcement to start taking volunteers for our upcoming study in January with University College of London, um, where we're taking thirty-two volunteers to capture the peak four to six minutes of the full release five meo DMT experience. And so we've had a special uh, 64 point headset made for the project. And uh, we're really, really looking fun to, uh, looking forward to getting some really, really uh, interesting uh, data that will be able to be studied for quite a long time after this. So we've got another question, I believe. La, 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 la. All right, Mr. David. Mr. David says, who, do, who did you mention is doing work around the importance of metaphysics for integration work? Yeah, I thought that might um, come up again because he uh, it is a really, really important paper. Um, so I will actually just link it for you here, actually. Um, what's that actually called? Um, well, the, the name of the of the author is Peter Sjosted. Famously difficult to say name. Um, uh, Swedish uh, heritage, I think. Um, yeah, psychedelic metaphysical integration. Um, here you go on the need for metaphysics and psychedelic therapy and research um, yeah really good clear read uh, I'll put it in the general chat there for everyone um, yeah so yeah, I, I think it's especially important actually when it comes to, to, to 5-MEO because a lot of what he's discussing really is is, is um, well it's bro more broadly like metaphysical type experiences which are endemic to psychedelic experiences but there is just generally in the literature because a lot of it is um emphasizes the, the you know the clinical aspects or effects of these, these, these substances so mystical experiences up until now had the most emphasis on the therapeutic outcome but there's lots of different very very much important things about the phenomenology like you know having emotional breakthroughs or um 
Yeah, or uh, or what my supervisor is now having a look at, like all these other kind of parapsychological things, like I was saying about seeing the dead that you didn't know were dead, or having that body experience and seeing how that correlates to the to the kind of therapeutic effects. But um, mystical experience has been, had a lot of attention, so he's kind of focused on that in the paper in terms of well, if this is what's happening, psychedelic experiences, which can be very, very, very. The paradox is that they can be simultaneously the reason why these people get better because suddenly they're in contact with something something sacred, something far beyond themselves and yet still intimately associated with themselves. And it's uh, it's this, just this profound experience of, of, in the contact with the, the beyond and potentially like the divine. And so that can, if you're dislocated from that, that can actually be the source of a lot of your pathologies and, and can be attributed potentially to, to all of us here not connected to that um and so when you have a contact with that that can be re very remedial of your ills um so but also it can the difficulty is that it is so so beyond um, and unprecedented in terms of your own experience and model of the universe that it can be what's referred to as like ontologically shocking and so you need you know at the very well at the very least you need integration but then you also his argument and many people's argument before his for actually writing a formal paper is that you need a metaphysical integration that's informed by that. You know, you have like trauma informed therapy for psychedelics. You might need metaphysics informed therapy, you know, um, and but it's not even that might not necessarily be enough for some people because it's a long complex sociological process we're going through here now the possibility of psychedelics become medicalized and at the moment even in retreat settings um, there is a strict clinical kind of a uh, um, screening criteria to ensure that people that are having these very potentially well they are like ontologically uh, shifting or like, you know, experiences which have implications for ontology that um, that they're not that they're not going to be harmed and that they are going to be you know they are essentially going to benefit from it so screening is important itself has contentious issues associated with it though given the kind of bottlenecking of like certain people and accessibility and stuff like that um but it is a very you know, it's a very very hot and important sort of discussion to be to be having about that yeah absolutely thank you thank you there might have just been all right it looks like we had one more question and this will be the last question okay I'm going from my third five experience tomorrow oh beautiful Technically my seventh, eighth, and ninth, because we do three, six, and 12 milligrams each time. Uh, the good old handshake, hug, full release protocol over the course of an hour. Last time I went, I experienced many of the things you outlined. I'm wondering if you have any feedback on how these experiences evolve over time once someone becomes more familiar with the effects. Do people report becoming more comfortable or more familiar with the experience and where it takes you? Thank you for this presentation. It's re it's uh, re reassuring to see the research outlining the similar ex uh, the similarity in people's experiences. Yeah, um, the idea of having more like subsequent experiences um, and it being yeah, and what the changes are and if they're helpful or otherwise. And yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, even this participant. Um, I didn't actually go into it in this particular paper, but there's another paper that's in review, which is looking at a couple of other participants that had Changa experiences. So basically DMT infused in like uh, herbs, which have, um, which can help to kind of, yeah, amplify the kind of DMT, but it's usually a lower dose of DMT anyway. Um, so, but then, yeah, so in that paper, looking at the, this idea that, they to varying degrees but actually more especially in this particular participant in this paper they took the substance to explore their previous near-death experience so there's this idea that you know that was well, a very interesting idea in the first instance that you have a spontaneous kind of spiritual awakening type experience from from let's say being close to death and obviously you're it's very different to having a psychedelic induced deliberately in a clinical or retreat setting or whatever, because it just happens to you and it can happen to anyone. And there's no supportive structure whatsoever in any kind of infrastructure. You just have to sort of help yourself find your own people and therapists and what have you. Um, but 
it's interesting that and it, this itself is another important avenue of possible further research for anyone it's like explore what how these near-death experiences integrate you know what do they do after the experience but i think there, ha there has certainly been studies on that but certainly not looking at people looking people having psychedelic experiences after it so you know coming back to a question of what subsequent ex experiences of a similar nature like can can do some people deliberately try to reconnect with that experience for the purpose of their own understanding and kind of closure with the experience and um, so this person had the 5 meo with a very deliberate intention to try to go back to that state um so yeah it's uh um it's yeah so having these subsequent experiences can be a kind of deliberate intention there's some intentionality in that but as, as to how the experiences will affect each other is a kind of a different different uh a different question i don't i don't know in, in terms of the direct answer of like if like what do people having many many five meo experiences for instance how do they how do they all their experiences differ because like i said there's actually very scant hate the literature on the qualitative nature of it let alone what the intricacies are between experiences and stuff and how they shift and evolve but um but it's also interesting in the sense of state dependent memory and this is kind of a other thing well it's the idea that you can access memories better when you're when the state that you're in when trying to remember them and then the state you were in when you originally experienced them are similar so if you're having a near-death experience and then have a 5-MEO experience and the experiences are identical or yeah then 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 that could imply that uh, the, the state of the brain at the point of the near-death experience is actually very similar to the state of the brain that happens when you take take 5-MEO so it's almost supportive potentially of 5-MEO kind of being implicated or the states being similar so the more that that happens then it could be that it could be a kind of avalanche effect of you being able to access previous states which are similar be them other psychedelic or near-death experiences or whatever so that's a way in which the experiences can evolve like over, over time because you could potentially be accessing the previous memories and that could also be contributive to the sense of kind of deja vu like being in that state before which i think you know m many of us here might have experienced because um because you you're in the same brain state so it's almost like a re-experiencing it's not just a novel new experience each time um yeah thank you thank you and uh just to tag a little bit onto that i would say in terms of how the experiences can unfold it completely depends on your integration it's a process that can go on for as long as you choose to engage with it um and so really working with that and um choosing how you want to find that stillness just like pascal was just saying um getting back to a similar state that you were in um one of the easiest ways to that we have our participants and that we've always been able to kind of revisit and be able to closely glimpse the memory of that experience is through various practices that bring us towards stillness meditation uh breath work things like this can that can allow a slow cessation of the thinking mind or at least a dampening of the thinking mind can really really assist with um, being able to access that memory because quite often that memory is very ineffable because the mind was almost not there when it was happening. But um, yeah, all right. Well, Pascal, thank you so much. We really, really appreciated you staying up late yeah. for us. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, it's been really, really fun. Um, thank you so, so much again. It's been yeah, real, real, real honor actually to meet you guys and do this webinar for you and for all you guys um, that, that came. That's very, thank you so, so much to, to all of you. Yeah, it's really enjoyable. Thank you guys. And good luck with all the rest of your, what seems like really amazing work. Likewise, thank you. Likewise, thank you likewise. You and can you tell everyone where they can kind of read more about you or uh, get in contact with you if they'd like or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can literally just put my, um, uh put my email here for you guys actually if you want um yeah is that all right yeah there you go so anyone can email me there if if, if you like and um, but if you go on just research gates or academia.edu um you can just put my name in and you can see some of my research there and stuff yeah. All right. And just remembering that I don't think they can see the chat. So I'll just read it out to everyone. It is p.i.m.michael at 
Greenwich, that's G-R-E-E-N-W-I-C-H dot A-C dot U-K. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. That was just sent to, I sent a couple of papers there, so I'm just going to. I put in, I, I answered the question. Oh, you already did yeah, that? In the, uh, <laughs> yeah, in the Q&A. I copied You've it. You've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you okay. so much, Kat so Pascal. Have a beautiful brilliant. night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.